Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have given the vice chair more minutes, but we don't want to uh, delay y'all or Representative Tran, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure Vice Chair Mitchell will be along. We are here today for hearing only on House Bill 797, and uh, we'd like to recognize Representative Tran to present the bill. Some of the things that are, some of the changes we're proposing, you can see on lines 56 through 59, we're proposing to Sorry. Uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> we're proposing to have the cannabis registry cards mailed out to, can you all hear me? All right. I'm going to speak without the microphone. Um, have the, have uh, the patients receive their cannabis registry card through the mail. We have a lot of patients, um, and I'll use a personal example. My father had Alzheimer's last summer, and so um, <coughs> he couldn't get out of our house, and then we put him in a nursing home. And we didn't go through the process, but there were other medicines, other needs that, were, that we were able to get to him. And so I can only imagine patients who need this registry card having to go to a facility to get the card would be a huge barrier. So for us to be able to mail the card to them would be a big help to patients who require um, a cannabis, cannabis registry card. The other thing I want to bring up, point out to you is on lines 67 through 71. And this language may change a little bit is a requirement for patients to visit their physician every six months. Um, we've heard from a lot of people that this may be an economic barrier for them. And so we're considering whether or not an annual visit would get us the data that we would need. As a state, we just don't have the data on the efficacy of cannabis. And so requiring at least a minimum of an annual visit will build the, the data that we need to track the, the growing usage of medical cannabis in our state. Now, from lines uh, 71 to, through 73, we also want to make sure that the dispensaries um, and the physicians are, are um, researching, sorry, I'm missing the word, but uh, when you do drug interaction, right? When you go to a pharmacy, they go through a database to make sure there's no adverse drug interactions. So we wanna make sure that we have that in place to make sure that there's no adverse interactions with any existing medication that these patients are currently on. And finally, um, section lines 83 through 87 is certifying, is, um, Prior to certifying any patients pursuant to this code section, a physician shall be required to complete a physician education course established or approved by the board relating or treating conditions with low THC oil, including side effects, adverse reactions, dosages, and possible drug interactions. Such course shall be made available for completion online. We want to make sure that our physicians, um, regardless of which medical field that they're focused in on, is trained to the best possible so that they can properly recommend um, the usage of cannabis medicine. So I know we're short on time. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Representative. You did a good job of presenting the bill. We appreciate that. Appreciate your brevity in doing that. We do have a question, two questions. Uh, thank you, Representative Tran. Um, a quick question here about um, line 67. A physician shall be required to reevaluate a registered patient at least every, at least once every six months. And you said the purpose of that is so that you can so that track track the progress of the patient on the medication, the efficacy of the medication, of the the cannabis medication. Okay. Is there? Right now, we don't have a lot of data on. I understand. Work. So, what what is and and forgive me for not knowing what what is in place right now in terms of what are the requirements? Are there any requirements that these patients be reevaluated or given exams? There is. Um, what we do with Elevated Health MD, we actually 
we do require that our doctor, once they do the evaluation, they come back and reevaluate after three months, six months, and a year. So it, to, to your point, sir, um, it is very important that we are establishing that doctor-patient relationship as well as making sure if their medicines change, that we're doing side effects change. That's huge because this bill is all about supporting people with medicine, and that's it, it's extremely important. Right, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, no, follow sure. up. So um, the, the three months, six month, and you said one year. Yes. That, it, it, but that's not in. It's not required. That is your. Yes. And again, I'm sorry. Do you mind introducing yourself? Yes, Cheryl Faulkner, CEO of Elevated Health Energy. Okay. All right. So that is that is Elevated Health's requirement currently, right. um, and you're looking to put this in, in that requirement in code. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Leader McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two questions. Uh, line 57, uh, what's the importance of, of the date April 1st, 2024? So I dropped this bill last year. Um, we will have to update it so that it will be either the 2025 or maybe 2026. Um, but it was just an implement. I'm sorry? Oh, that's what you're talking about. Implementing it, should it be like you know, one signature of the governor, or is that? Uh... Uh, yeah, we just want to make sure there's enough time for the state okay. to, to implement and it, whether it's it? upon signature of the governor or um, six months to a year afterwards. Okay, line one twenty seven. Yep. Uh, no reporter may dis discharge, threaten, refuse to hire, or otherwise discriminate, retaliate, support, or bargain. Can you explain that a little bit more? You said line 77? 127, excuse 127. me. Line 127. So we want to bring this in line with, say, opioids, where a doctor prescribes a painkiller and you can still go to work. You're not going to be fired for having a prescription for painkillers. We also want to make sure that someone taking low dose THC um, is allowed to continue to work. They're not going to be fired um, for taking cannabis while at work. Now, we will um, follow federal guidelines. So let's say an airline pilot would not be allowed to be taking opioids while they're flying. They would also not be allowed to take um, cannabis. cannabis low dose THC. And I, I just think of my question dealing with that is you know you got fire EMS, yes, others. I mean if your insurance is not going to cover an employee because of this, I was just feel like it should be explained a little bit more in that area. Of, you know, even talking about the guidelines. And I, I'm happy to look into further clarifying okay, these we'll lines. But we just want to make sure that this is front lines with how we treat um, descriptions like painkillers. Thank you. Uh, the chair. Um, I wasn't in the legislature when yeah, the bill was first passed. So I, unfortunately, but I can find out. We're okay. And the second question is related to line 67 through, well, 67 and a few lines down. Um, I would assume, and I know that you said this may change, I would assume that if a person is under the guidance of a physician, um, based on whatever the diagnosis is, that the physician should be taking account on the progress of the cannabis. Um, so you may not have to have it every six months because based on the diagnosis, they may come in once a month. Um, so the feedback um, I've been given, we're flexible and making that change. We just want to make sure that patients are having that relationship with their physician 
Um, one, so that we have the data to track the progress and the efficacy of um, the cannabis medication. And one, you know, the, the relationship between a physician and a patient, the better and stronger that relation is, the better it is for the patient. Thank you. One follow-up. Sure. I do think um, that is something I don't think that we really have thought about. You know, if you look about look at the opioid epidemic and how that kind of went uncharted, we definitely don't want this to be in the same category. So thank you for bringing attention to the matter. You're welcome. Chair recognizes Secretary Earhart. Thank you. Just one follow-up question, uh, kind of expounding on what Representative Maynard indicated. I just want to kind of clarify. So physicians will be required to reevaluate a patient. So how is that tracked? In other words, you're saying that the physician needs to provide, or in other words, the patient, the physician needs to provide verification or proof. What exactly is being provided? Um, again, I'm just thinking about privacy, medical issues, your your organization, or I'm just using you as an example because you're here. You understand? <laughs> um, so this, this data that you're looking to collect, this is... Um, essentially private medical data that would be provided to. And we're going to provide, follow all of the HIPAA guidelines and you know, the medical board would be the ones who would, I guess, collate this data and use this data. Um, uh, you can provide. Yeah. It's an op. It's an opt in. Yeah. And we're actually when you're entering it into the state site, there is a part for the waiver act part of it as well. So okay. just to have that being updated, I would say. Thank you for that. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate that. Uh, Lady McDonald, did you have another question? Here's yes, a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I was noticing the line 83 through 87. Uh, prior to certifying any patients pursuant to this code section, a physician, a physician shall be required to complete a physical education course established or approved by the board um, that it can be done online. So this requires any physician to have additional training before they could issue a card. That's, that's the intent. Um, after some feedback, perhaps we need to make this as more of a way to incentivize physicians, because right now, physicians aren't required to have any education on cannabis to recommend medical cannabis. And I think that puts us in a dangerous spot. And so having some form of education, um, I think it is needed. Have you had any pushback from the physicians on the requirement for additional training? Not yet. <clears throat> Okay. Well, I, I don't see any other questions. Is there anyone here who would like to speak uh, in favor of the bill? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. Cheryl Faulkner, Elevated Health MD. Huge supporter of this bill. Um, to what we were saying earlier, to actually have the relationship and have it mailed, what we were saying, or not having it mailed. I had a patient yesterday, a uh, little boy, self-harming, autism, mom can't get medicine. In the state system, the state card says printed and shipped. However, she is still two weeks, three weeks out. We can't even tell when she's getting her card. So to your, we need to actually get this stuff mailed to our patients and or get an email once they're approved through the state because the doctors are required, obviously they're MDs, 
to be required through the state to actually get an email or saying, hey, you're approved to be able to at least take their driver's license and an email, some form of identification, maybe a, um, a scan bar like they do in Florida, and at least allow them to go right into a dispensary to get their medicine. Absolutely huge. I do. I am in agreement that there needs to be a follow up with your doctors um, at no additional cost to the patient. This needs to be on us as the card companies to be responsible so that we are not with the opioid addiction issue, that we're actually combating that. So there is a responsibility on us, and we take it very seriously, that we are establishing the doctor-patient relationship. That is key. And I do think we need that as Georgia, as a, an infancy state right here, we definitely need that data to move forward so that we can open this bill up to other things as well. So great supporter. Thank you all for your support and all your efforts too. We appreciate you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor of the bill? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Jenny Helms, president of Leading Age Georgia. We're an association that supports uh, retirement communities, um, life plan communities, uh, hospice, nursing homes for the nonprofits. And um, we have been very interested in the medical cannabis bill for a number of years because we recognize how it can benefit older adults suffering from pain, but even more importantly, Alzheimer's and the agitation, anxiety, restlessness, and sleeplessness that comes with it. And we've been working with physicians at Emory as well as in other areas of the state and in the U.S. and in Israel. And we think that um, this has a lot of opportunity for reducing uh, other more serious medications like opioids and antipsychotics. So our position is we want to help make it available to older adults. We like the thought that it could be mailed to them versus them having to go to a public health department. The average age that moves into a life plan community is 83. And so helping to have access is very important. Um, my life partner is Larry Toon, a geriatric psychiatrist and neurologist at Emory, and I ran this bill by him, and he said that um, <clears throat> the education needs to be limited to like one to two hours, needs to be online, and really needs to have CMEs in order to help other physicians want to do this type of education. I can't really speak to the other parts of the bill, but those are the two that I'm most interested in, and I really appreciate your concern on this bill. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor of the bill? Yes, ma'am. We have two more. Okay. The lady behind the column. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hello, my name is Yolanda Bennett with the Georgia Medical Cannabis Society. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we have been assisting patients navigate through this medical cannabis process from what we were able to obtain from the internet. Our issue has been not being able to find a physician list. We had to go and search for ourselves because this against the law, according to the law, that we cannot have the listing of doctors so that we can provide that for patients. So, but my concern about this particular bill is the six months. So I don't know if that's considered in favor or against, but the six months that's gonna pay, like she said, basically if it's going to cost more for the patients, it's gonna drive the patients back to the street. And then not just that, the price at the dispensaries. I have a receipt from the dispensaries of how much it costs to obtain your meds. Me and my wife went to botanical sciences and we would have spent almost $1,000 for our medications for a month's supply for both of us if it wasn't for BOGO. We took advantage of the BOGO, buy one, get one free. And so that being said, that if patients are required to go every six months to an evaluation that's not covered by healthcare insurance, that's going to be a problem. 
Not only that, you have a whole lot of online pop-up doctors that are popping up right now that are taking advantage of patients. Understand you're supposed to have a direct interaction with the patients from the uh, direct interactions with the doctor-patient relationship, but how are they really and truly? I understand from being sick in a wheelchair and cannabis saved my life. I am a cannabis patient. And then having to have a virtual appointment with the doctor is one thing, but to actually see the doctor, but not to have, I've, we've had reports from some patients to call us and say, hey, I called about my card and I missed the appointment when they called me. However, a few minutes later, I, I was approved for my medical cannabis card. So it needs to be some type of check and balance with these online companies. I'm all for convenience. I'm all for patients being able to get their cards in the mail, but have, having to go to the uh, health department to pick up your card, that's an issue, you know, because you're, you're having to actually physically go out just like me. I have limited mobility. Also, you're protecting the medical, you're protecting people on their jobs. My issue is with our medical cannabis card, our driver's license number is attached to that in which our driver's license number goes to the DMV. If we already have an identification on our card for the medical cannabis number, why is our driver's license number on there in the first place, which we're a moving target when we're driving for the drug expertise class, whatever they can identify you of being intoxicated for THC. So we're driving around with our driver's license number on our card in which basically we're a moving target. So we sneeze on the road, the police pulls us over. And then next thing you know, oh, you're intoxicated. We suspect you're intoxicated with THC. If they're gonna say that automatically, you're gonna see the cannabinoids in my system. So we need some type of protection. The employment is great. I need to be protected when I get in my car. So that's my concern too. So. But as far as the bill, every six months is too much. You're going to push patients back to the street market. Okay, Thank you. so <clears throat> as I take it, you're in favor of the bill, but not that provision for not an exam every six, every six months. If you can take the six months out okay. or provide some type of stimulus to the patients, because if you go all the way back, we've been paying for a medical cannabis card since 2019. What that, since me, me personally, since 2019, going back for the medical evaluations every six months so I can go ahead and stay in compliance mm -hmm. and haven't had a dispensary until last year. Mm -hmm. So what about all of our patients that are had to be subjected to pay for this card all this month, the evaluations, the added fees? And what do we have? Okay. Well, thank you uh, for your uh, thank you. for your comments. Any someone in favor, in favor of the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and everyone in the room who has come out um, to support and speak about this bill. Education is the utmost important when it comes to matters like this, and uh, I just want to speak from who I am. My name is Melanie Jacobson. I work for Medical Marijuana Therapeutics in Georgia. We help certify and guide patients throughout the state of Georgia. And we have been doing this since 2019. So I've had quite a bit of experience. I am the cannabis consultant. I work very, very closely with the medical doctor. And so I have seen firsthand, especially what all of y'all have talked about, the accessibility for patients and making sure that this is as safe and as effective as possible. And so what I really would like to talk about first is, you know, what you were just speaking about with this six month rule. I think that that is something that, you know, we're looking at, when we look at that, when you look at places like Florida, they have this six month rule where they must see their doctor every six months. They just allowed for telemedicine, making it more accessible. The purpose of that, and like, you know, you were just saying, we do not want that to be on the patient. As a, as a medical practice, we do not want that to deter patients or deter anyone from being able to have access to this medicine that changes their quality of life. I mean, when I tell you that I have seen so many patients go from taking 40 pills a day 
to one, to not being able to get out of bed, to now they can do whatever they would like to do. This is life-saving treatment. This is quality treatment. We do not want to restrict that. But that being said, however, the six-month period makes it so that doctors can track their patients, they can guide their patients. And we talk about spending money at the dispensaries. You know, these dispensaries, they work very well with patients trying to make sure that it is accessible as possible. But having guidance from that doctor is also very important every six months to say, hey, is this working for you? Is this cost effective? Is this health effective? And checking in to make sure that they really are able to utilize this medicine to the best of its benefit. And without something like, and let's say we do it every year, let's say that we have the annual every year, building that patient um, relationship and making sure that, you know, they can ask their doctors, like every single time I sit down and I meet with a patient, I am going through everything with them. Hey, is this working for you? Do you feel like this is too much? Do you feel like this is too little? It is a crucial part to monitor them and to get that data because as you all know, here in the States, we do not have a ton of research on this. Anything that we can get where, like we were talking about with those HIPAA rules, but making sure that we're getting the data will help doctors, will help students. This will make it so that we are making sure we are doing this safe. We are being the leaders in Georgia. Georgia has a huge potential right now to be the leaders. And especially when we talk about, um, you know, these other points of making sure that they can mail the card. Florida already has that. Florida is mailing their cards. Florida is not making that, putting up that roadblock for patients. And when we talk about, you know, um, the other parts of the bill where we want doctors to be educated, you know, when you go to your physicians for any other medication, they are educated on those medications to be able to tell you, hey, this is your condition. This may work better for you than this. Of course, there's never a perfect, you know, everyone's body is different. But being able to have that guidance from a physician who knows what they're talking about because they've had medical education, CME is super important. Why shouldn't we do that for cannabis? This is something that we could do correctly here in Georgia to build that block, to set that example for the South where we actually take care of our patients in a way that they're not running around going, well, where do I get my card? Who do I talk to? These doctors, which, you know, there are doctors who are certifying patients in the state of Georgia who are not in the state of Georgia. Let's bring this back to Georgia. Let's maybe implement that into this bill where, you know, we are making it so that doctors in Georgia are the ones certifying our Georgia patients only. These are all very, very crucial points. And as I have served patients throughout the years since 2019, this is something that has been brought up to me consistently. And the other part of the education is, you know, a lot of questions that I will get is, what is the law? What can I do before the dispensaries existed? Where do I go? How do I get my medicine? This needs to be safe. And we have the opportunity to do that now with Botanical Sciences Truly and the other dispensaries that will soon be to come. We have an opportunity to do something really beautiful here in Georgia. And um, I really appreciate y'all listening to this bill today. I really appreciate y'all listening to me and letting me speak on behalf of my patients. Um, and I am happy. And I, one, one more thing I want to touch on about the, when you asked about the card, when does it actually be renewed? It is renewed every two years. Yes, Cheryl does a wonderful job at making sure that they see their patients, they take care of their patients. But like I said, you know, doctors are not required to do that right now with this, you know, two year renewal. They may, there's something floating around, but I haven't really seen it nailed down that it, there is an annual. And that is crucial, just like with any other medicine. So if I can take any, any, any thoughts, any questions, any comments, any concerns, I'd love to speak more if you let me. <laughs> um, we do have question from Secretary Earhart. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> and um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, and just as a reminder, this is sort of the purpose of subcommittee. You know, it's often time where we ask the questions. And so my questions are in no way intended to be negative on the bill. I just want to make sure that we all understand. Um, so you say that, um, so currently that the cards, and I don't know a whole lot about the cannabis mm -hmm. cards, but you said they're valid for two years. And what happens at the end of two years 
right now? Like how are they renewed? So at the end of two years, either the doctor or the patient has to reach out to each other in some way. We always reach out to our um, patients and say, hey, it's time for you to renew. And at that point, they will have another appointment. Now, this is just what we do. And this is what I believe the state requires, that they have another appointment, that they have a check-in. Does the state number? Um, that they have a check-in and um, that they are, but there's nothing that says they have to look, I mean, they have to look at medication interactions. We want to make sure that's absolutely a thing because that is something that before we didn't necessarily see all doctors doing that they would just give, and especially these doctors that are out of state, they'll give you the card. We have patients who actually come to us from other doctors who have seen other doctors, have gotten certified from other doctors, but need guidance. And so they will come to us and they'll say, okay, well, the doctor gave me my card. They didn't go over my medication or actions. They didn't do anything else. What do I do? But to answer your question, um, right now they do have that annual visit where they do have to speak with them, but there's no like exact to my knowledge right. regulation on exactly what they need to find out during that right. appointment. And, and again, I'm just trying to unpack so yeah, I please, fully understand. Please. Um, because I, I do know that, um, this wouldn't be necessarily the first time that legislation has been proposed that, um, you know, affects Georgians' lives or, or what they are expected to do um, with the end goal being to obtain data. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that's the main goal. I understand the, yeah. the, the importance of the doctor-patient yeah. relationship, but I've uh, I've certainly seen situations before when, um, and you know, it, it's a it's a just cause. It's you you want to have accurate data, particularly for something that's as new, right, as this is to Georgia. Um, but my I guess my concern or question there would be, you know, are there other scenarios where the state mandates mm -hmm. that doctors must examine patients to renew the prescriptions? And I'm I'm just comparing this to all other sorts of prescriptions in the state. Mm -hmm you know, should this not be left up to the doctor and the patient? Should we not be leaning into the doctor's discretion and his discernment and his medical training uh, to be able to determine when, you know, I go in for a medication, let's say I need something and, and he'll say, I'm going to follow up with you in 45 days or four months, or if it's a long-term prescription, I guess I'm just wondering about the merit of involving the state to mandate that doctors must uh, perform ex these exams every six months in order to renew a prescription. I don't know that that's occurred. And I, I, I really appreciate um, your thoughts on this. And as far as, you know, collecting data, the main focus I believe here is to make the patient the main focus. And when you talk about, you know, are there medications, other medications where they have to be monitored in such a way, this is still a controlled substance um, and it is still schedule one. Uh, as far as my knowledge, since I do not work with opioids personally, um, but as far as my knowledge, and if there isn't, I'm sure there should be because doctors need to be following that. But, and anyone in here is welcome to let me know if, if you know about this, but um, that there are laws that doctors must monitor their patients when they are on something like an opioid. And since this is, medical cannabis, um, you know, besides the data, making sure that, because with this medication, right, it's to us what we learn in our education. I did about three years of a medical education from Oaksterdam University and the Medical Cannabis Institute and the Holistic Cannabis Academy. And what we learned during that time um, is that, you know, Without this data and without, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, oh, sorry, um, <laughs> lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, without this data, you know, and without it being regulated and without us knowing what doctors need to understand is that this medication may not be shown in practice or in research or whatever we do have to be physically addicting, but anything can be psychologically addicting. And it is very important to us that the patients of Georgia are able to utilize this tool, this beautiful tool in a way that they can actually get the results they need and make sure that we are following that patient. And I just don't think based on what I've seen since 2019 with patients coming to us from other doctors that, I mean, I hear you yes, we should trust our doctors to have that patient relationship and to follow up.
but without it being something that's mandated. And I'm not saying it has to be every six months. That might be too frequent. You know, Florida might be doing that too frequently. Other states that are doing that. And there there are quite a few other states that do that. Maybe they are doing it too frequently. Maybe that's not needed. But a yearly visit, absolutely needed, especially with the unknowns of this medicine, if that answers your question Thank fully. Thank you. Yeah. Last follow-up, and it's really on the mailing issue. Could this be a, I'm wondering why this wasn't put into the original legislation. Um, could it be a, I have no idea, I'm speculating, a, a chain of custody issue uh, that they don't want? Uh, I don't know how many how many medical cannabis cards there are in Georgia. I don't know. Could, thousands? Uh, are they, maybe they don't want them floating around in, in the post offices and through the postal service? I don't so, know. yes, I, I, and I completely hear you on that. Um, upon speaking to the Department of Public Health, that actually, you know, gives the cards. And just, just so that everyone's aware, um, when you speak about, like, some of these departments of public health are two hours away from patients. Um, and some of them do not have cars and some of them are disabled or some of them are elderly and cannot move and then they cannot get their card. Um, and when you speak about it actually being attached to the driver's license, that's interesting because in Florida, they actually can look up your driver's license card at the dispensary where you wouldn't need the card. So that's something actually to look into as well. But with certified mail, if we can have it so that they have to, their ID has to be checked, you know, um, why it wasn't put into the law to begin with, I think that that was an unattended oversight of just, you know, they didn't necessarily, and I, I, I'm speaking from just a place of my opinion, I'm not speaking from, but upon t talking to DPH, it seemed like their biggest concern was that, um, like you just said, floating around, we want to make sure that it's certified. And if other states can do that, if other states can figure that out, I'm sure here in Georgia, we absolutely can as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, Secretary Earhart's uh, comments about uh, the, phys the required uh, physician follow-up, and I was thinking about that relative to other medicines. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, sometimes uh, when my doctor changes my medicine, he'll he, she actually will say, we want you to come back in in three months and let us do a blood test and see how this mm -hmm. is going. Certainly understand that, but it's not mandated by the law that you do that. Uh, also, too, um, of course, with the data and trying to determine the effectiveness of the medicine, et cetera, it sounds like most of the concerns is about the addictive qualities or, or their examples of terrible things that have happened with drug interactions that that you're concerned about and that may be an unfair question is out of nowhere really but are there cases where something terrible has happened with somebody doing the low thc medicine is some drug interaction problem so as far as my knowledge and when we're talking about low thc i think that is a very um important differentiation when we're talking about cannabis you know to my knowledge and through the education that I've had and through, you know, obviously working with patients, um, no one like with other medications like opioids and things like that, people don't die from cannabis. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't things that could be harmful that we haven't been able to study yet because it's been federally illegal. Um, and when we talk about low THC, I want to make a big differentiation here. So low THC in cannabis, when you have this plant, the cannabis plant has about 100 to 150 different cannabinoids and terpenes. Most people know cannabis, THC, CBD. When we talk about THC, we talk about studies that have been done and not necessarily here, but over overseas and things like that. You know, when they're studying this, the THC level is not necessarily at the levels that you're seeing in let's say California or Colorado those levels are very, very high. Those levels can go up to 99%. We do not have testing on 99% THC over a long period of time. And like I said, it's not physically addicting to our knowledge, but anything can be psychologically addicting. And so while with the medication interactions, like we go over every medication that a patient has and what the interaction is. And while most medications do not interact with cannabis, it is fairly safer than a lot of other medicines. 
there are sometimes medication reactions, especially when given talking about opioids. It actually can raise the effectiveness of the opioid. So the patient needs to be notified, hey, if this is going to be, if you're going to be taking this in addition, you may need to lower your opioid dose so that you do not have that reaction. So cannabis itself by itself is not going to necessarily, from my knowledge and from working with patients, going to cause adverse effects, but if not monitored, and like I said, with that six months, if not monitored and watched closely, you know, one of the things we talk about with patients is what is your relationship like with this plant? You know, we want to make sure all of our patients are having a healthy relationship with this plant, that they're not, because a lot of these conditions, you know, PTSD, pain, these people are really suffering, you know, and, and we want to make sure that we take that suffering away. We don't want to give any more suffering, you know, with a lot of other medications, when you're recommended it, like for example, Advil, even, even Advil, that's not even a prescription med, but that can wreak havoc on your stomach. If you take it for years, especially on an empty stomach, cannabis is not going to do that, but the monitoring and making sure that the doctor is educated that the patients are as educated on their body as possible is very important. And those medication interactions, them knowing that very important. If that answers your question fully. It does. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for your uh, comments. Absolutely. And um, we appreciate that. I don't see any other questions. And yeah, yeah, well, you, you do have one. This yeah. You, Tim. Yeah, sure. Uh, what is the possibilities of having another hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Come back before, yeah. yeah. This is a uh, hearing only today. Uh, very quickly, thank you for your comments. Do we have anyone speaking in favor or opposed? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Edward Lindsay. I'm with the law firm of Denton's uh, US LLP, and we represent Botanical Sciences, which is one of the license holders for the uh, growing and dispensing of medical cannabis. We very much favor uh, the bill in terms of making it easier for patients to receive access to their cards. Right now, there are artificial limitations that uh, were previously discussed by <laughs> others, uh, making it difficult for folks who need the cards in order to get the medication to be able to do so, particularly folks who are having to travel long distances. I do caution and my client cautions about trying to step in as a legislature as to how to practice medicine uh, and would encourage you to sort of, if, if you feel like you need to look at what is already required in terms of the commission or the DPH or the medical board uh, to provide regulatory oversight, go that route and let that take place rather than have the General Assembly start having to get involved in how someone should practice medicine. I think that's a dangerous precedent, uh, something that is always difficult for a General Assembly to do, particularly when there are like four different doctors <laughs> in the entire General Assembly. And that's the only thing that we would add to sort of add that caution. The, the law already sets forth certain regulatory requirements by the commission. Uh, if that needs to be beefed up in any way, uh, allow them to, to, to get involved in that who are looking at the medical issues rather than have the General Assembly start having to try to prescribe how someone practices law, uh, rather practices medicine uh, with their patients. That's my only concern. Well, thank you very much uh, for yeah. those comments. Uh, is anyone else who, who we have had a lot of testimony in favor of the bill, of course, is anyone who wants to speak in opposition to the bill? Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. I think that will conclude our hearing. This is hearing only. Um, Representative Fran, I met with Chairman Powell yesterday afternoon to discuss your bill, and uh, we are doing a hearing only today, but I will get back with him, and we will, uh, we will be in communication with you about it. Thank you for the bill, and thank you for your hard work on it. And it uh, sounds like that it uh, certainly has some good things in it, and so we will... Uh, We'll take the next step. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. We are adjourned.
what do y'all think of that? Please comment below. Please subscribe. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. This is a very important conversation. So let's keep talking. Let's see what happens next. Please stay tuned and join the mailing list. And what other plugs can I do? Please subscribe to the hemp channel. It's USA Hemp Revival. We really need uh, more subscribers so I can live stream over there and not here. When I live stream here, it kind of goes mm, algorithmically and I lose views and money from my YouTube. So I would really appreciate that. Also, to make up for that, you can also donate to our education fund, keeping people educated and communicating and connected. And we really want to do uh, an event in Bartow County this year where our friends are suffering right now in jail because of this beautiful plant. So I'll see y'all later. Have the best day ever. Keep on educating and keep on being your beautiful selves.